Release, I'm letting go If you're in it with me, 
If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. Teach me how to follow in your ways. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit, lead me. Spirit.
Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. We've been talking about uh, God weaponizing you. In fact, the title has been, Have You Been Weaponized? You know how the government will take something and then they'll weaponize it, whether it be a chemical agent or whether it be uh, artillery, what they weaponize. They weaponize a soldier. Well, that's what God wants to do. He wants to weaponize you as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Remember, we've been preaching that. Amen. I told everybody, John, they need to listen to Bert Clendenin on that message called Soldiers. Who has listened to it since the pastor said that last week? One person. Thank God. One, maybe two. They say, Thank you for obeying your pastor. Amen. Write this down. Soldiers. That's the only name. B.H. Clendenin. If you look up soldiers on YouTube, it'll pop up. It's just a voice only. It's a picture of some military guys. Amen. You may get some toxic masculinity out of that stuff. I hope so. That's the greatest sermon I've ever now, heard in my life on faithfulness and commitment. Soldiers by Burt Clendenin. I've listened to it nine times since January 1. I can't get enough. And, and he preached it in 1982. And Brother Clendenin is in heaven now with Jesus. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. So we're going to read something, and then I want to bring it up in, out of the Amplified Bible. And, and uh, you'll see why in a minute. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, Paul says. What, what's it mean when a preacher says finally? It means absolutely nothing. It's like when a preacher looks at his watch, what does that mean? Nothing. It means nothing. I, I told my son Wesley, I said, I'm gonna, sometimes I start out sermons with in closing. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Amen. Finally, my brethren, verse 10, be strong in the Lord. Everybody got a Bible? You got a Bible. When you come to this church, you better bring a Bible. Right. Or you better have it on your phone or your droid or your iPad or whatever you got, but you need a Bible. You know, someone wrote me, uh, Facebook messaged me two weeks ago and said that, they said, I've been a Christian for 24 years and Elevate was the first church I've been to where they said, you need to bring your Bible. I know a lot of churches don't tell you that. A lot of churches will start out with, let me tell you a story about my dog. And then let me tell you something, a funny thing that happened to me and my wife at the mall today. And then with the 10 minutes they got left, they might refer to some sermon, scripture, maybe. But people love that. They love to be entertained. You ain't going to get that here. You're going to get the word. Oh, yeah, we have fun. My wife will tell a story, embarrass me, or I'll embarrass her, and I'll have to buy her a dress. <laughs> we love having fun. You know, you saw worship, man. We love it. Miss that guy, John Bilka. Miss you, brother. You come here to torment me and love me at the same time. John, well, like I said, one of our elders, and he used to, what he did today, he used to do after every, every worship. And sometimes he'd feel the Holy Spirit like today, and other times he'd just say, amen, God bless you. Let's stand and give the Lord a hand and, and greet one another. But when he's feeling it, appreciate you. God took a drug addict. Come on. Come on, took a drug addict. Made him into a preacher. and a lover of Jesus. But don't you want that on your tombstone? Here lies James, a lover of Jesus. Put on the, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Look whose armor, it ain't your armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, which tells me if you don't put God's armor on, you are no match to stand against the wiles of the devil. Is that clear from that verse? Amen. And so he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now hear me. You're going to wrestle against flesh and blood at times. You're going to stand against flesh and blood. You hear me? Next, uh, this coming Friday, Good Friday, from 1 to 4 o'clock at the local murder mill, which is called Planned Parenthood, off of 48th and Old Cheney, a, a, a large group of the body of Christ from all over Lincoln are gathering. 
this Friday, Good Friday, 1 to 4 o'clock. They're gathering to stand for life. They're gathering to have a voice against those who have no, or for those who have no voice. Amen. They're going to say abortion is murder and we believe in life and they're going to pray that that clinic be shut down and that those people get saved. Hello. This Friday, one to four o'clock. So, because people will be like, well, pastor, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. The Bible says, you know, we wrestle against uh, spiritual forces. Not, no, you're going to take a stand. John the Baptist got his head cut off for telling King Herod, hey, you are sexually immoral. Having your brother's wife is against God's law, and it cost him his head. Now, he could have said, no, I just go in my prayer closet, and I just pray. I just pray for King Herod that his eyes will be open." No, no, no. Sometimes you stand. God said in Psalm 94, who will rise up for me? Who will stand for me against the workers of iniquity? But we know that they themselves are just tools of the devil. They're not your enemy. They are tools that are used by the devil as your enemy. So when, when we see those escorts out there lying, and when we see the abortion doctor and he's lying to, to, to people and whatever, we realize, you know, that they have a, a soul Jesus died for, but we also hate what they do. Hate. It's in Revelation. Jesus said, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So... We pray they get saved, we pray they're, but we're gonna stand there. We're, we're gonna stand against, okay, let's move on. But we do wrestle, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, amplify to bring it out a little bit better, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Because of that, that's what the word wherefore means, because of that, take unto you the whole armor of God that you, someone say me, that's you that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. When is the evil day? That's the day you're under attack. That's the day calamity comes. That's the day you're being persecuted. That's the day you enter into trial and tribulation. That's the day when you lost your loved one in a car accident. That's the evil day. Okay? And having done all, you fasted. You've prayed, you've spoken the word of God, you've forgiven, you've labored, you, you've been in the intercession. Everything you know what to do and it seems nothing is changing. What does God tell you to do here? Keep standing. That word stand means remain in force. In other words, don't quit praising, don't quit praying, don't, keep, don't quit reading the word, don't, don't quit intercession. Keep doing what you've been doing and stand. It's not, it doesn't just mean this. It means continue in force. Amen. Okay. That you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore. Here's the first piece of the armor. God's armor. This, this is listed in order of priority according to God. To you and I, we wouldn't list the, the girdle of truth, the belt of truth. We wouldn't have listed that first. We would have maybe listed the helmet of salvation, Pastor. Let's get them saved. Yeah, maybe we would have listed the sword. Now, twice, twice in this armament, the word of God is going to be talked about. The first place is right here. He says, gird yourself with what? Truth. Truth. What is truth? Pilate asked that question and he had truth standing right before him. Pilate said, what is truth? If I'd have been Jesus, Kelly Cody, I'd have said, uh, you're looking at it. Jesus is the word. Jesus is truth. Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen. So Jesus is truth. The word is truth. Let me read this out of the Amplified. Here we go. In conclusion means absolutely nothing. Be strong in the Lord. See, because King James said, be strong in the Lord, power is mine. Okay, how, pastor? How? Draw your strength from him and be empowered, how? 
through your union with him. Now, if Jesus Christ is the, truly the Lord of your life, if one day, however you did it, you said, Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I ask you, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I, I, I pledge my allegiance to you. I trust in you. When that happened and you meant it, the Bible says that Jesus came, forgave you of all of your sins, and not just that, he made you brand spanking new on the inside. You became a new creation. Old things passed away. All things became new of God, right? That's what it says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. You became brand spanking new. You were at that time baptized in the Christ. A lot of emphasis put on water baptism. Paul didn't do that. No, baptism, water baptism has its place and you should be water baptized if you're a believer in Christ. Your, your, your infant baptism, worthless. Baptism at confirmation, worthless. In fact, your baptism in a church, worthless if you didn't make Jesus Christ the true Lord of your life. Some people get baptized for religious purposes. They went down a dry center, came up a wet center. That's all that happened. But the Bible says, if you are in Christ, you were baptized. That is the one baptism Ephesians talk about. It says there's one God, one Lord, one baptism. It's not your water baptism. It's when you were baptized spiritually into Christ. When you said, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I'm baptized into Christ, into his death. That's what it says in Romans 6. And then I'm raised up by Christ into newness of life. Amen. Amen. So... Uh, that started my union with Christ. Right? I was baptized into Christ. We became united. I received his life. I received his righteousness. I, 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 rece I received, uh, he, he took my sin. I received his right. It's called the great exchange. I became united with Christ. Now, how, does, how do I stay united with Christ, people? How do I, how do I get more in, in union with Christ? Through prayer, hear me, through worship, through reading his word, not just reading it, but meditating it, taking a verse of scripture and just mulling it over and over and, and like, I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Man, I'm gonna think about that until it gets in my heart. And I'm like, woo, yeah, I get the revelation now. Uh, through, through serving people, yeah, amen, amen. Through, through giving, through generosity, that's how I stay in union with Christ. And this verse here says that if you want to be strong in the Lord, you're going to you be empowered through your union with him. Does that make sense? Yes, sure it does. Put on, notice, something you got to do. The armor is not going to fall on you. When Elisha and Elijah were going and Elisha knew Elijah was going to be taken up in a whirlwind. And that last day, you can read it in, in Kings, Eli, Elisha said, Elijah would try to tell Elisha, you stay here four times. You stay here. He goes, no way, buddy. Wherever you go, I go. I know the Lord's going to take you today. And I want what you got. I want twice of what you got. And finally, after the fourth time, Elijah said, what is it you want? He said, I want a double portion of whatever you got. And Elijah said, if you see me when I'm taken away, it'll be granted. You can bet they were joined at the hip. In fact, so close were they, it took a fiery chariot to part them. Elijah went up. Elijah said, I see you. See, listen, you'll have no power in your life till you see the risen Christ. You'll have no power in your life until you see Jesus risen up and seated at the right hand of authority and power. You need to see him. And when that happened, Elijah, Elijah dropped the mantle. Preachers say it fell on, didn't fall on him. Read your Bible. It fell right on the ground. The Bible says Elisha went over and picked it up. Put on the full armor of God. You put it on. 
How do you put it on? Meditate in it. Look at what it says. Let it tell you what you've got in Christ. Let it tell you what the armor does. You put it on. God ain't going to come and dress you like you're a three-year-old. Elisha took that mantle and he said, to the, he went up to the, to the Jordan River and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Pow! And that river parted. Before manifestation, there was a sound. What a great word, man. I ain't gonna ask you if you come up with that by the Holy Ghost. I ain't gonna ask you. Okay. Put on the full armor of God. Now watch this. For his precepts. I love this. What are the precepts of God? Where do you find God's precepts? Pastor, what are precepts? God's commands. God's ideas. You find them in the word. You find them in the word. How do I want to know what God thinks about something? I find it in the word. What does God think about marriage? I find it in the word. What does God think about finances? I find his precepts in the word. What does God think about me raising my children? Or so? I find it in the word. What's God think about me being an employee? I find it in the word. What's God think about me being an employer? I find it in the word. What's God think about and say about relationships in my life? I find his precepts in his word. So he's telling you and he's telling me, clothe yourself with God's precepts. So that you may be able to successfully, someone say successfully, successfully stand against, watch, the schemes, the strategies, and the deceits of the devil. Well, one of the devil's schemes, strategies, and deceits, it says, you know what? You're born gay, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Well, that's a lie from the pit of hell. But you won't know that if you haven't immersed yourself in the God's precepts. Because we all have friends and relatives that are of that persuasion. Boy, it got quiet all of a sudden. And so instead of lovingly giving them, this is what God says about this type of behavior, and I'm concerned for you because I'm concerned for your soul. Instead of loving them, we just say, oh, well, the Bible's irrelevant for today. That part of the Bible, God needs to catch up to the 21st century. And we don't just do it in that area. We do it in areas of shacking up together. We do it in areas of premarital sex. We do it in areas of, of our finances. Oh yeah. We do it in areas of what we watch, what we listen to. Some people think they have a right to hold a grudge, to hold unforgiveness. When God says you have no right at all, in fact, if his spirit's in you, he commands you to forgive. That's right. That's right. Commands you. And you can because if his spirit's in you, the love of God is in you. And that's what you need. You need love to forgive. Amen. Amen. Who is good preaching, Pastor Mike. Thank you. His precepts, I love this, are like the splendid armor of a heavenly, well, excuse me, hev heavily Heavily armed soldiers. So Paul's thinking about a Roman soldier. Man, how majestic they were. You saw a band of Roman soldiers. You were right to fear. They were majestic. They were disciplined. The things they did with those shields, incredible. You ever seen movies where they make a, like, a, like a, the tortoise shield over stuff? And you think, oh, that's pretty cool. That, that was common with the Roman Empire. They were masters at it. Incredible. Uh, so that, why'd you give you his precepts? So you may be able to stand successfully against the scheme strategy. Otherwise, you're going to be confused. Otherwise, you're going to be wishy-washy. You're going to be like the Bible says, a wave of the sea driven with every wind of culture and tossed. Because your emotions get involved. And all of a sudden, emotion is dictating precept instead of God's word dictating precept. For our struggles, not against the flesh and blood, contending only, that's what I like, only, contending only with physical opponents. 
But against the rulers, against them, there's times you're gonna have to stand just like the apostle did and said, hey, whether it be right to listen to you more than God, you judge. We cannot but obey, we cannot do but the things which we have seen and heard and they continue to follow Christ. And as the brother said earlier, they paid for it with their lives, many of them. But they were grounded in the precepts of the word. against all that spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, or because of that, put on the complete full armor of God. I love it. Eddie B, you know, Eddie B is, he comes up here once a year and sing, has a prison ministry, goes in over 550 prisons every year. He goes to a church called Full Armor Biker Church. It's in Texas. I would love to go visit there. But I don't have a bike, so I don't know if I'd fit in. I could imagine just everybody with leather jackets and riding up in their full armor biker church. I love it. Lots of toxic masculinity floating in that church. Amen. <laughs> Put it on so you'll be able to successfully resist and stand. Resist and stand. Resist and stand. Resist and stand. Your ground in the evil day of danger. Of course, I, we already talked about that. Having done everything that the crisis demands, stand firm, fully prepared, immovable, and victorious because God knows every one of us are going to face trial, tribulation, adversity, death. We're going we're to face a uh, smeared reputation. We're going to face uh, getting stabbed in the back, getting gutted in the front. We're going to face that. God, in his love and his mercy and his power, he's equipping us. Whew, I'm getting excited. Okay. Stand therefore. Means hold your ground. Think of an offensive lineman for the Huskers. Had a game yesterday and the Huskers won. Amen. Hopefully it won't be the only win this season, amen. Think of the offensive linemen. They don't just push a little bit and then, oh, resistance and let the guy go by. If they do, they ain't gonna be on that first, uh, they're not gonna be first team. No, they resist and push and resist. And they don't just stand there, they're pushing. They're either pushing them back, they're pushing them to the left, they're pushing them to the right, they're pushing to make up an opening. So think of that when you come to this verse. Let your loins get, be girt about with truth. Now the, the Amplified says, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins. Now let me talk about that a minute. Um, King James says, your loins girt about with truth. And we're gonna come to two types of people. First we're gonna come to the regular uh, person, not, not the soldier of God that... Uh, Paul's talking about they're going to come to a regular disciple back in Jesus' day. In fact, even in uh, Elijah's day. They wore this six to eight inch girdle, some made of cloth, mostly back then made of cloth if you weren't in the military. Military was made out of leather, made out of cloth. And here, here's, let me just read this. Oh, wait, I forgot. I always forget this verse. This is what Job said. You remember Job? Anybody in here suffer as much as Job? Anybody lose all your children, all your livestock, get boils on you, and this is when he's got those boils and he's taking broken pieces of pottery to scrape the scabs because his boils all over his body itched, and, 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 and the only one left was his nagging wife, and I don't mean that to be mean, but she was a nagging wife who told him, why, why do you hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. That's what she told him. God made her pay for it too because he said he had seven children that were killed. In the end, he had twice as many. She had to go through childbirth 14 times. <laughs> Put that on the television, amen. Here's what Job said regarding God's word. Neither all this trial, all of it, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed, I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Okay, the, the, the girdle, the loin. Men wore girdles back then. Not the kind you're thinking of, ladies. Gird your loins is a phrase that is an urgent call to get ready for immediate action or coming event. 
When God said, remember Ahab, the brother talked about him up on the mountain. Elijah prayed. Elijah said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. You better get down. And then it said, hey, Elijah girded up his loins, right? He's getting ready to take action. He girded up his loins and he ran down that hill and he outran Ahab's chariot. Did over 40 miles an hour. Incredible. Hussein Bolt, eat your heart out. It's an urgent call to get ready for immediate action or coming event. The phrase is related to the type of clothing worn in ancient times, even as far back as Elijah, before any vigorous activity, the loose ends of clothing such as tunics, cloaks, mantles, etc., had to be gathered up and tucked into the wide band worn around the midsection of the body so they wouldn't trip over it. Wouldn't be good for Elijah to be running down the hill and trip over his garment, right? The band, usually about six inches wide, sometimes eight, also served as a kind of a pocket or a pouch to carry, I suppose to say, personal items. Personal items. That's how Southerners say it, personal items. <laughs> Such as a dagger, money, or other necessary things. Gird up your loins for the believer is a call for mental and spiritual preparation. T.D. Jakes would say, get ready, get ready, get ready. That means gird up your loins, gird up your loins, gird up your loins. Did I do a good impression of T.D. Jakes there? No, not good at all. You never support me in that. You know that? I don't know what the deal is, man. So God says the first piece of the armor, Ephesians 6, 14, what's it say? Read it to me. Read it to me. You got a Bible? <laughs> Having gird up your loins with... <laughs> this is the truth. Didn't say stand having your loins girt with cultural opinion. Didn't say stand having your loins girt about with what your denomination believes. Didn't say uh, stand and have your loins girt about with what you think will bring, uh, make you more popular and accepted. Gird your loins with truth because without it, you're gonna be a wishy-washy, flim-flamsy, loosey-goosey, flat-footed, weak-kneed, banana-back, limp-wristed Christian. Last week we talked about where does your courage come from? Comes from conviction. Where's that conviction come from? Born of the word of God. Aren't you tired of being wishy-washy? Aren't you tired when someone says, hey, what do you think about? Well, you know, I, I mean, I got a friend that. No, you just say, well, let me tell you what God says about it. See, you're not the judge. God's the judge and he already judged. I just agree with his judgment. And that's going to cost you. That's going to cost your relatives. That's going to cost your friends. That's, that's going to cost you. Simply for saying, well, Jesus said, remember Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to, there's no way around it. I love it when people say, well, Jesus never said anything about such a, such an issue. And I say, well, uh, actually he did. Yeah, but it ain't in the Gospels. I said, no, but it's uh, in the books of Moses. Well, Jesus didn't say that. I said, well, Jesus is God. John wrote, John, the Gospel of John, he said, man, if we had to write down everything Jesus said and did, the world itself couldn't contain the volumes. Wow. All right, let me show you this on a Roman soldier. Got a picture here. It's kind of blurred, so forgive me. Stole it off the internet. Borrowed it, excuse me, because I'll delete it here. There's a Roman soldier, a dude on the right. Kind of hefty dude. All right, that's because I should have made it narrow. Anyway, I wish I could do that for me. Stand in front of the mirror and just go. Bring them edges in. Yeah, bring it straight. 
Ain't going to have them, brother. Not in this world. Maybe the next one. Amen. There's the Roman soldier. Amen. And there's his leather. His is leather, of course. And listen, that piece of the, I'm not saying he put that on first. I'm not saying that. God says that's the first piece you need to put on though. Why? Because it contains the truth. Because without this, your armor, you forget it. Without that, that piece, that leather girdle, that thing held his breastplate on tight so when he ran or when he fought, the thing wouldn't be flopping. That thing held his little leather skirt from falling down and showing his BVDs. He held his dagger. He held a, a, a pouch with whatever he could put in there. He held his sword. It'd be like a policeman's belt. Ask a policeman. What's the, what's the most important piece of your uniform? Oh, that belt. That holds my gun. That holds my clips. That holds my handcuffs. That holds my taser. Anybody been tased in here? Anybody? You been tased? I want, get with me after church. I want to know what it feels like. I don't want to get tased. <laughs> Where's Sharon Bartek? I gave her a taser. She accidentally tased her finger. <laughs> trying to turn it on. <laughs> yes, she did. Love you, Sharon. That's the most important piece. Right there. Put my music on, fellas. That's the most important piece. Look at what God says it is. It's the first piece that he wants you to become acquainted with. Why? Because that word contains his precepts. God is right. He's holy. He's just. He's good. And he's right. And even when culture says, nah, God is right. And even when something happens to me and I don't quite understand it and it looks to me like God is unfair, Shannon, uh-uh. God is right. When I'm praying for somebody, and they die anyway. God ain't at fault. God didn't create the world the way it is. He created it perfect. There was no sin. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was no death. Sin has brought this. And sad to say right now we live in a fallen world. And that's why you need the armor of God. You need to put that armor on, man. We just covered one piece. Next week is Easter. So guess what we're going to preach about? A resurrection. Amen. Next week is the whole reason for Christianity. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no Christianity. Everything hinges. Think of that. On the resurrection. If that's a hoax, if that's a lie, Let's go eat, drink, and be merry because we're going to be dead like a dog before you know it. But thank God, over 500 eyewitnesses. Such was the resurrection that Jesus' four brothers believed in him after they saw him raised from the dead. And James, his brother, his half-brother, became the head of the church in Jerusalem. And Jude wrote the book of Jude. And James, the head of, wrote the book of James. Incredible. 500 eyewitnesses. Every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would please. I'm going to ask you two questions. Not here to embarrass anybody. Here because I love you, care about your soul. Hopefully you care more about your soul than you care about, well, I don't know, I don't want to be embarrassed. Not here to embarrass you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, you say, I'm going to ask you two quick questions. You say, Pastor Mike, I've drifted from Jesus. I have. I received him as my Lord and Savior. And, but Pastor, I've drifted. And I, I know I'm not right with him. And I need to get right with Jesus. And Pastor, today, I feel the love of God in here. And I feel the Holy Ghost. And he's compelling me to make things right with Jesus. I want to recommit my life. See, it's not about emotion. It's about it's the Holy Ghost messing with you because he loves you or second question you say pastor i've never known jesus personally I've, i believe in him and i've considered myself a, 
a religious, a spiritual person. But pastor, I've never opened up my life and said, Jesus, I want you to come and be the boss of my life. I want you, Jesus, to be my Lord, my Savior. I want to I want to place my allegiance in you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want to live for you. So if that's you, you say, Pastor, I need to pray to, to recommit my life to Christ. Or, Pastor, I want to receive Christ Jesus, make him my Lord and my Savior. If that's you, please stand right where you're at. Just stand up right where. I'm not going to call you the front. Just stand up so I can see you. And I'll pray for you right where you're at. If that's you, don't worry. Don't be embarrassed. Greatest thing you can do, stand for Jesus. Everybody here, they'll be thinking, wow, that's great. There's one. Everybody here be thinking, man, they stood. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus. It's not about the church. You're not standing for me. There's another. You're not standing for me. I can't do nothing for you. And while you're standing right there, where you're standing, close your eyes and say, Jesus, here I am. Just talk to him right where you're at. Jesus, here I am. Standing for you, Jesus. Jesus, standing for you. Want you to be my Lord and my Savior, Jesus. Come on, anyone else? Going to wait a few more seconds. Anyone else? I need, Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. I need Jesus. Two people standing for Jesus. Wait five more seconds. Come on, somebody, you're feeling the Holy Ghost. Don't be ashamed. Just stand. We'll pray with you. Jesus' name. All right, let's all stand. And you two that stood, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to close your eyes, all of us, close your eyes and look heavenward. Man, I just love, I, I'm not into visualization or nothing like that, but I love, it. maybe you'll call it that, I don't know, but I love just seeing Jesus sitting on his throne yeah. with his fire in his eyes and his arms outstretched. And his love just, just, just coming to me, pulsating toward me. I love to see that. And you, you too that, that stood and the rest of us, look up at the heaven. I want you to see Jesus and his love for you. However that looks to you. Because he's the one that can save you. He's the one to forgive you, not me. And let's, I want you two to say this prayer out loud. The rest of us, we're going to say it with you in support. Everybody ready? Get your heart and your mind on Jesus and say, Jesus, I thank you that you love me, you sought me, you have found me. I am yours. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of all of my sin. I forgive everyone who ever hurt me or harmed me, did anything against me. Jesus, I repent. I turn to you. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. And more importantly, I receive you. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Come on. One more thing before you go. You two that stood in the back. There's a young couple back there, Kirby and Jessica. Please go with them real quick for three minutes. They want to put a gift in your hand and they want to put something in your hand. They're back there, pink shirt and real pretty woman back there. Uh, go, if you got friends, take them with you. Relatives, that's fine, take them with you. Go back there. Let's give them a hand as they go, please. <laughs> Tell you, man, no greater miracle than getting born again. You, you may have a, a deadly disease, but you got born again. And say you die, your deadly disease, no greater miracle than getting born again. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this army of God out here. Thank you, Lord, for your, your weaponry, your outfit, Jesus. Your armor, the full armor of God. Lord, bless them as they go. In your name I pray, amen.